Welcome back, folks, to Hashtag Ask GSM here today. I am Graham GSM Matthews for episode number 98. Only two episodes to go into the blockbuster milestone 100th episode of the show in just two more weeks. Can't wait for it. Um, but what's even more exciting than that, just want to mention this real quick, SummerSlam coming back to the Northeast area next year, baby, for an NXT on Saturday, SummerSlam on Sunday, Raw on Monday, the exact same thing they did last year, this past year in August, last month. Um, they're doing again next August, and you can bet your ass that I'll be there for both shows in 2016 and in 2017. Maybe I'll do NXT too. Maybe Raw this time. I couldn't do all three. I was way too tired, but maybe I'll push through if I know there's going to be some grand return or if Raw's going to be as great as it was the night after SummerSlam like it was this past year. But uh, just wanted to mention that the news broke this morning. No better way to kick off a Monday morning. In addition to seeing a kid wearing a Kevin Owens shirt on my campus this morning, which was pretty fucking cool. Um, someone I've never seen before. So that makes uh, that rounds up the total to four wrestling fans at my school, which is pretty awesome. But anyway, let's get down to your questions. If you want to send in a question, do hashtag AskGSM. You can find me on Facebook. Leave a comment on the post I usually put up on Sunday nights or on the wall itself at facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Feel free to tweet me on the Twitter at restaurant with hashtag AskGSM. And finally, last but not least, be sure to leave a comment on this very video down below in the comments section. I'll be sure to include your question in next week's edition. So kicking it off with the YouTube questions from Brad S. What are your thoughts on a two-on-three tag team table match of the tag team titles at Hell in the Cell between the New Day and the Dudley Boys. I love it. I feel like it was going to happen. I wrote it in an article about last week, I think, for Hidden Remote, 10 matches or X amount of matches we could see at Hell in the Cell, that being one of them, a tables match. I don't know if it's going to be two on three. I assume it will be. Um, I mean, we've seen that before. We saw, I think it was La Resistance versus the Dudley Boys. I want to say Unforgiven 04. Or it might have been 03. It was one of those. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was 03. Um, they did a two on three elimination tag team tables match, and the Dudleys won anyway. So I feel like, I mean, they could always win the belts at MSG on Saturday, which would be pretty cool. That's their backyard. They came back in Brooklyn. You know, they're from the New York area. You know, EC Dub, whatever. I know that's Philadelphia, but you know what I mean. That's where they kind of. Um, yeah, that's kind of where they made their uh, where, where they made their names famous back in ECW, coming up in the ranks. So I get to them winning the belts on Saturday in MSG, but regardless of who wins on Saturday, I definitely see a rematch at Hell in a Cell. That goes without saying. I don't know if it will be table stipulation, but it would be pretty cool. I mean, some people have said, you know, we have the tables match stipulation coming up at TLC in Boston, but I feel like you could do it there too, but it would be even better if they did a tables, um, or rather a TLC tag team title match. I mean, when was the last time we saw that? I know we saw it in the main event of TLC 2009 with D-Generation X and Jerry Show. A surprisingly good match considering the people that were involved in Big Show and Triple H. You know, people you wouldn't think. I mean, Triple H has had a lot of great ladder matches. Big Show, not so much. But it was a very pleasant match. You put the Dudley Boys in there with a the New Day and possibly another tag team like the Primetime Players or Returning Usos. Um, the Wyatt Family, Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose, whoever it might be. That's going to be a kick-ass match. So I would do that at... Um, I would do that at uh, TLC. You could always do a tables match at Hell in the Cell. But um, even RJ pitched this. Some other people have said this as well. Maybe you bring back Spike Dudley and you do a three-on-three -three tag team match. Tag team titles on the line or not, it doesn't really matter. Uh, maybe they could do the free bird roll with the new, with the uh, Dudley Boys. But yeah, you bring back Spike and you do Dudley Boys and New Day three-on-three -three tag team tables match. Or even without the table stipulation. But something along those lines um, could be a great add to the Hell in the Cell card. Next question from Jared Bodel. His question was, who do you think Seth Rollins will drop the WWE Championship to? And when will it happen? I mean, you can really pick, pinpoint any date, and um, no one really knows. From what I've heard, there's no plans. Like, oh, we plan on having him drop it at the Royal Rumble to The Rock, like CM Punk a couple years ago. There's really no plan set in stone. So whenever he retains, it's like, oh, he survived another match. Like, I thought he might lose it at SummerSlam. I thought he might lose it in the Night of Champions, and he keeps on winning. So um, Seth Rollins, I, I mean, at this point, I've said it before. I said it months ago. I would just keep the belt on him until WrestleMania. That might sound too predictable, but who else is he going to drop it to in the next couple of months? The person who I think he will drop it to, to answer the second part of your question, will probably be Roman Reigns. I mean, who else? Triple H, maybe, for a one-off reign? I can kind of see that. Don't really care to see it. Kane, same thing. I mean, that's even less of a possibility. I don't really want to see that either. Um, I'd have him drop the title to either Dean Ambrose or Roman Reigns. It'd probably be Roman Reigns, but... Uh, I mean, I would just do what anyone else would do and do the triple threat at WrestleMania between Reigns, Ambrose, and Rollins. Do that triple threat title match, and you give the belt to one of the other former Shield members there. Um, so I would just do that match. And I mean, again, who would, who would he defend it against in the months to come? I mean, Kane at Hell in a Cell, Triple H at Survivor Series and or TLC. 
Rumble doesn't really matter. He doesn't have to defend it in February. Brock Lesnar, maybe? I mean, you can always do any other combination of anyone else in the roster right now. There's a few other possibilities. Um, but yeah, I would have him drop it at WrestleMania in the spring and have him drop it to either Roman Reigns or Dean Ambrose. Have it kind of pass along the torch with the former Shield members. Um, next question comes from the first KFC. With NXT being so popular within the last year, do you see Vince McMahon trying to take over the show from Triple H? Good question. I mean, there's a chance that it could happen. I highly doubt it, though. That is Triple H's pet project. That is his baby. I doubt he's going to hand it over to Vince McMahon. He's way too busy with the main roster. I mean, you can always say that because NXT sold out the Barclays Center the night before SummerSlam and all the success that they're having, like you said, Vince, see that, you know, Vince sees NXT's success and he says, hey, maybe I can make some money off of that. That's definitely a possibility. I would hope not, and Triple H keeps it as his own. And just because something becomes popular, I mean, like with WCW and Raw and everything else that's become popular, not only in wrestling, but just in anything in life, um, when people start to see success, they go overboard with it, and they just kind of you know, hit it into the ground. It's like beating a dead horse after a while, that old cliche. But hopefully that's not the case with NXT. The quality of the show has not deteriorated any since the um, TakeOver special last month. So I would hope just because, I have something in my eye here, sorry, um, hopefully just because they, not just because they sold out the Barclays Center, Vince sees that and says, oh, we can make a lot of money off that, let me take over and give it more creative control and sell out all these huge arenas going forward. I mean, it's great they sold out huge arenas, but I don't want to forget where they came from and like these smaller arenas like Full Sail and all these other places. I don't think they will. I don't see that happening, but um, there's a chance. I mean, I could definitely see where you're coming from and I had that same fear too, but... I feel like Vince is so busy with the main roster stuff right now with Raw and whatever else, freaking out about the ratings that he's not worrying about NXT. His second question, what is your favorite and least favorite Hell in a Cell main event match? So I assume you're talking about the pay-per-view. We got a lot of Hell in a Cell questions this week in terms of favorite Cell matches, least favorite Cell matches, so I'll get to those in a little bit. Um, but my favorite match, main event match to take place at the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view since 2009, my favorite would probably be... Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins from last year. Because that was the one cell match since the whole birth of this pay-per-view, which has been a complete fucking train wreck. I'm not talking about numbers, like they've gone down and stuff. Maybe they have them. I wouldn't be surprised. But having the cell match once a year, the same time every single year. I mean, once a year is fine. Just to do it at the same time every year. Oh, it's, it's October. Let's do a Hell in a Cell match. It makes the match feel meaningless. And I wish they would get rid, they would get rid of that pay per view. That said, they're doing the right thing this year. I mean, the, 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 I mean, last year they did it right, but last year or this year they're doing Undertaker and Brock Lesnar. That's a match that needs to sell. No disqualifications, no countouts. The end of the feud where it all started 13 years ago in 2002, and no mercy. So I can definitely see um, that being you know topping this one. But yeah, my favorite Hell in a Cell main event match in so nine would probably be. Ambrose and Rollins, because like I said, other than Taker and Lesnar this year, was the only cell match in the last six or seven years at, to take place at that pay-per-view that needed, that was, it was justified in having the cell stipulation, because Ambrose and Rollins, that feud had been going on for so long, such a great feud, a lot of great matches, I mean, some people are, you know, the match was good, it was not so good, they've had better matches, which is true, they've had better matches in the past, but it was still a very good match, and the interference from Bray Wyatt was, was kind of hokey, excuse me, but, uh, Still, I thought the match itself was great. It was uh, very fitting of the cell stipulation. Least favorite? I mean, I've said this before. I don't know why I don't like this match. Might be for a number of reasons, but my least favorite cell main event, Hell in a Cell main event, would probably be D-Generation X versus Legacy. We go from the latest installment to the first installment. Um, I just didn't like that match. It was Triple H, Shawn Michaels, obviously, versus Cody Rhodes and Teddy DiBiase. The feud was fine. I thought it did a good job of kind of elevating Rhodes and DiBiase. They didn't, they didn't win tag team gold after that. If anything, DX did um, a couple months later. But um, they were put in the main event of a WWE pay-per-view, so that's really saying something, right? They put it over the uh, um, World Heavyweight and WWE title matches. So that's really a testament to what they thought of these guys at that time, although DiBiase would be later gone from the company, but I digress. Um, I thought the match was okay. It wasn't a bad match. It's just that it really wasn't much of a match. They locked Triple H outside of the cell for most of the match. Legacy did. And they beat the living shit out of Shawn Michaels inside the cell before Triple H came back with bolt cutters, broke open the cage, locked out Cody Rhodes, or it might have been DiBiase. I don't know, either or. And they beat the shit out of the guy that was remaining in the cell. So it really wasn't more of a match. It was more of an angle than anything else. I mean, it told a good story, but I just wasn't a fan of the match for whatever reason. I thought... Even Orton and Cena, I mean, that's weird to say, but I thought Orton and Cena was a better match um, inside the cell that night than DX and Legacy. And his third question, is Cesaro's push over? 
I wouldn't like to think so, but I wouldn't be surprised. I don't even I don't even know if you can really call it much of a push. I mean, he got a few wins here and there, like he has been the last couple of months. It's not like he won a title. I mean, he may have invented Raw against John Cena, but you know, other people have done that in the past. Um, you know, for one night only kind of things. I mean, they never really. He lost more often than not. He lost all of his big matches. He lost to John Cena. He lost the Big Show. He lost to Kevin Owens. He loses to everybody. He beat Rusev that one time, but other or maybe twice on SmackDown too. But SmackDown, let's face, it, is irrelevant. Um, but really, wasn't much of a push. I mean, I know he was getting over, but that's kind of in spite of management, not because of them. And I mean, they need to build up Big Show. I fuck. I don't know. They need to build a Big Show at least to be somewhat credible. I mean, I hate saying build up Big Show because the guys, it's the fucking Big Show, but they need to make him, and I mean, they can't job out Big Show going into Brock Lesnar's match at uh, at the special on Saturday. I understand that, but why Cesaro? There's so many other guys in the roster. That's why guys like Heath Slater, Fandango, Adam Rose, that's why they're employed, to do the job. Why does it have to be Cesaro? It makes no sense. Um, so hopefully, I mean, it could be worse. The guy could not be on TV at all. <coughs> Damian Sand now. But yeah, uh, it could be a lot worse. I'm kind of holding out hope that there's still some more um, they're going to be doing with him. But, you know, like we've seen time and time again with this guy back in late 2013, 2012, last year when he won the Honor of the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, they just push him for like a cup of coffee and then they get cold feet and they stop. You know, just just stop cold turkey. It's ridiculous. So hopefully it's not the end for Cesaro, but it wouldn't surprise me like they've done these start and stop pushes in the past with guys like Dolph Ziggler, Kingston, Barrett, Miz. The list goes on and on and on. Next question comes from Frank Shear 15 His question was, what is your favorite Undertaker Hell in a Cell match? Um, I mean, he's had so many of them. You could say Taker and Lesnar. I'll probably be doing a video, and I don't want to answer all the questions in this one video, but I'll be probably doing a random video blog in a couple weeks here for the channel, probably the Friday before Hell in a Cell, running down my favorite Cell matches of all time, so I don't want to give too much away. I've probably said them here before, but I want to run down my top five favorite Cell matches. Um, this probably being one of them, Taker and Edge from 2008. He's had better cell matches against, you know, Shawn Michaels and Brock Lesnar, Mick Foley, all these other ones. So I mean, don't jump on me just because they said Acre, uh, Edge and Take Acre, um, Edge and Taker from 2008. But I had such a connection with that feud. I mean, you said favorite, not best. So my favorite Taker match inside the cell would be that one because, like I said, I had such a connection to that feud. That was the year I started watching wrestling full time. And um, that was one of the first feuds I was exposed to on the SmackDown brand was Edge and Undertaker. It went on for so long. The feud went on for like a year and a half, technically, from when Edge cashed in Money in the Bank in May of 2007. And it culminated in this huge cell match at SummerSlam. Taker comes back from a two-month or two-and-a-half-month hiatus. Um, they go all out. They do a lot of spots with the camera and everything else where it kind of harkens back to... Um, all the other spots they did throughout their feud, like when Edge returned at uh, Survivor Series 2007 and he knocked out The Undertaker with a camera. Taker hit Edge with a camera in this match. And all this other stuff I thought was so cool. You know, the, the putting him through hell thing was a little bit hokey, but I love that match. It was very well deserved in the main event spot of that pay-per-view. And even Edge has said in the past, like on, pa on, on past podcasts and, and stuff, that he was actually lobbying to go on top of the cell with Taker and maybe go off of it. I'm not exactly sure. Maybe even just go through it. Um, but they shut that down immediately because that was just after they went PG, unfortunately. But I love that match so much. I love that pay-per-view, but that was a great match. Um, next question of his, push, repackage, and release. Kevin Owens, Dolph Ziggler, and Damian Sandow. This one was a little bit easier. I always love these questions, by the way. I say it every week, but I always keep on sending in the push repackage release. I don't know if anyone else is doing them, maybe if it's just something exclusive to this show, but I love the questions. But I thought this one was a bit easier than some of the other ones I got this week or in past weeks too. Um, I would push Owens. The guy is a money maker. I think he's got all the tools to be a big star in this company as a top heel. So I would push him, repackage Ziggler, and really Sandow. Now I'm a huge Sandow fan, but the thing is, is that both Sandow and Ziggler, they're both interchangeable in this case. Um, both of them need repackaging. Sandow isn't even on fucking TV. Like, where did this guy go? He was doing the Macho Mandow thing, which was really not that good, but it was something. And then even after the whole Hulkamania thing, Axel's gotten more TV time in the last six months than Sandow has. So, I, don't, I mean, the guy was the single most popular guy on the entire roster in late last year, early this year, and then they just do nothing with him. He's not even on TV. It's not like he's jobbing out. He's not even on TV. He's not on main event. He's not on superstars. I don't know if he's doing house shows or not, but he's not even on any programming whatsoever. It's ridiculous, um, but whatever. Um, yeah, so I would just release Sandow just because if you had to pick between the two, 
Both of them are extremely talented. I think you can make more money off Ziggler at this point than you can Sandow. Ziggler's kind of been looked at a, at a certain way for years. Oh, he's never going to get be, uh, above a certain level. Sandow, same thing. I feel like he could be a world champion. Maybe that's kind of a stretch if we saw the World Heavyweight Championship. But the reason I say that is because he's not even on TV. Like, there was never a point in the last seven years where Ziggler was not on TV because they weren't pushing him. You know what I mean? Sandow was, has just not been on TV at all. The guy's looked at as a, as a joke. Ziggler at least has some credibility, so I would push him or repackage him to being a heel again or whatever. Sandow, I feel like there's just like a... And I was texting RJ this morning. He's, he said it perfectly. He's a lost cause at this point, so it's unfortunate. But I would release him, repackage Ziggler, and push Owens. Um, Hector S, all from, also from YouTube, name your WrestleMania dream card 10 matches. Now, I hate doing, like, dream cards, like your fantasy booking, and, I mean, I, if it makes sense, like, I'm not going to do Stone Cold versus John Cena or Austin and Cena, Cena and the Ultimate Warrior Hulk, like, I'm not going to do matches that don't make any sense. So, to kind of answer your question, I did write an article um, for Hidden Remote a couple months ago, uh, early, late June, so, like, three months ago running down my dream card for WrestleMania 32. Now, some of these matches are outdated, but um, just that for the sake of your question, I put down Stephanie and Rousey, which is not happening at this point. I think Ronda Rousey is filming a movie at, at the time that WrestleMania is happening. So even if it wasn't, though, I feel like Dana White would not let her compete at WrestleMania. Um, so I put down Stephanie McMahon, Ronda Rousey, Samoa Joe, and John Cena, which I feel like could be a kick-ass match. I feel like Joe probably won't be on the main roster by then, but again, dream card, so I put Samoa Joe, John Cena. Also considering they're, they're very good friends in real life, so that'd be a great match just for that reason alone. Um, Daniel Bryan and Bray Wyatt, it's kind of random, but I put that down for the Intercontinental Championship. Give Wyatt some gold. Uh, Daniel Bryan has never beaten Bray Wyatt before at WrestleMania, or never beaten him at all in singles competition via pinfall. And technically, Daniel Bryan never lost the Intercontinental Championship, so I would do that match. Randy Orton and Finn Balor, just to get Balor on the card, just to see his WrestleMania entrance. But he's, and I said this right after WrestleMania this year. I have a feeling he won't be called up until the night after WrestleMania, but whatever. Um, I put down Orton and Balor, which would be a kick-ass match. Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens I did for the United States Championship. That was during the time that Owens was still involved in the U.S. title chase. That match still could happen just over the Intercontinental Championship, but I would have Zayn come back, attack Owens, do the title match at WrestleMania. Zayn finally gets his big win over Owens and winning the belt. Um, Undertaker and Sting retirement match. At this point, I feel like it's not happening. They just don't want to do the match for whatever reason, but whatever. Um, yeah, just a retirement match, both in their home stage of Texas. I mean, Sting's go he's already a loser. Taker, hopefully he loses at Hell in a Cell, so it's going to be a battle of the losers. So um, I don't know what you do. at. Uh, I don't know how that would really work out now that Sting's lost two matches on pay-per-view, but I would do that match, Taker and Sting, just to say they did it. It would be a big money match for all wrestling fans, in my opinion. Um, Lesnar, Sheamus, some people would say that, you know, Lesnar being, uh, he, he's being wasted in a match with Sheamus, oh, that's such a demotion for him, he was in the main event last year, I can kind of understand that, but if Sheamus is in a world champion by that point, I fucking hope not, but if he's getting a push still by that point, and Lesnar's not doing anything, the match would be great, the match itself is something new, it's something fresh, they're still looking around for a potential opponent for, for Brock Lesnar, people are going to moan like, oh, Sheamus, what a, what a, what a joke, you know, I can kind of see that, but I feel like the match would be great, and it would be a nice little boost for Sheamus, and it'd be a great little showcase for Brock Lesnar as long as he wins. Um, I put for the tag team title match, Cesaro Kid. I put, like, the Usos and the Wyatt family, but, you know, by this point, we've had so many different tag teams that would include the New Day in there. The Dudley boys, of course, are back. They have to be involved in that equation. The Hardy boys, if they're done with TNA, if they come back in time for WrestleMania, would be amazing. Um, yeah, I would do that match. Rock and Triple H is kind of a given. I would do that match. I mean, we've seen it before, but what else are you going to do with the Rock at WrestleMania? Have him face Roman Reigns, maybe? Can kind of see that, but I don't know. I feel like Rock and Triple H, they've already set it up. Just go with that match. And, of course, the match I mentioned before, triple threat for the World Championship in the main event, Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, and Roman Reigns. Moving on now to the Facebook questions. From Mark S., he's got two questions here. What is your opinion about what is Kane is all about at the moment, and what do you think is wrong with him? I'm, of course, they're doing the whole um, double personality thing, so they're going to have him do director of operations and the mass Kane thing at the same time, the demon Kane, as they call him, which is such a dumb nickname. Um, they're probably going to be doing that for a while, just playing mind games with Seth Rollins. It's as simple as it gets. His second question, who would you like to see John Cena fight for the U.S. title? Um, that's the big question in everyone's mind right now. We'll probably see tonight on Raw. Um, Samoa Joe, like I mentioned earlier, Joe's, uh, Joe's Cena match would be amazing. I don't think it'd be turned into a full-fledged feud because Joe is, 
he's going to be in down in NXT for a while, I feel like, uh, for a while. So they'll they'll probably not promote him to the main roster just yet. I mean, I said the same thing about Kevin Owens, but who knows. Finn Balor is another one. Other than that, there's not many people left for seeing in their face that are fresh faces. Maybe a Cesaro again. Roman Reigns is a... Uh, He's a fresh face, but he's involved with the Wyatt family right now. So I don't really know. I, um, I said Roman Reigns in an article last week, but he's still doing the thing with the Wyatts. So I don't really know. Um, but yeah, maybe someone from NXT like a Tyler Breeze. I'm not really sure. We'll find out more tonight on Raw. And his third question, what would be your opinion about any of these wrestlers joining NXT? Um, should any of them, and if you choose that they should, how do you think they, uh, do you think they could be successful in NXT? Now he's talking about an article that WWE.com put up. Um, just yesterday, you know, saying five wrestlers that we want to see in NXT. Now, all of them, of course, were like losers, including the Big Show. It was Heath Slater, Damian Sandow, Fandango, Big Show, and Jack Swagger. Um, five people they feel like could rejuvenate their careers down in NXT. Big Show, absolutely fucking not. Stay Big Show. Keep him far, 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 far away from NXT. I don't care if he lives in the area. Keep him far away from NXT. Thank you. Um, as for the other four guys, uh, as for the other four guys, for Heath Slater, maybe the guy, all these guys need gimmick overhauls. Um, Heath Slater is a very good athlete. He's just a job guy. I feel like they're never going to do anything with him, so whatever. Um, so I could really, couldn't really care less about Slater being down in NXT. Swagger would be cool. He's still a good wrestler. He's over. I feel like this We the People thing would be very much over, and it has been in the past with the NXT audience. So I could see him going down there. I wouldn't really mind that. Fandango, if he goes down to NXT, which he has in the past. Um, he needs a new gimmick. He needs to become Johnny Curtis again, whereas, which is where the you know his whole character was born in NXT, uh, both in Redemption and Season 2, I think it was, Season 4. It was Season 4. Um, but yeah, he needs to become Johnny Curtis again, or at least get rid of the Fandango shit, because that's not going to fly in NXT. No, no they're not going to treat that with any respect at all. And finally, for Sando, I say absolutely. He's not on WWE TV anyway, so might as well put him down in the next day. That's where he cut his teeth when he was coming up. You know, he was still doing SmackDown in early, you know, mid-2012. But at the same time, he was done in the next day. He was having a few good matches. No real memorable feuds, but he had a few segments. I think maybe one with John Cena. I don't know if it aired, but I know he did a segment with John Cena down in the next day. Um... So yeah, he's not even on programming anyway, so you might as well just put him down in the NXT and hopefully it, uh, it does something for him to kind of rejuvenate his career and get him back on track. The next question comes from Andre G, also from Facebook. How long should the war between the Wyatt family and Dean Ambrose and Roman Reigns last? I feel like it has to end at Hell in a Cell um, with the Orton being involved in the equation. Just blow it off there. I mean, Roman Reigns and Bray Wyatt have technically been feuding since Money in the Bank over three months ago. It'll be four months by the time Hell in a Cell comes around. And I feel like both guys just need to do something new. It's been a good feud. They've had a lot of good matches at SummerSlam, Night of Champions, and the matches on Raw, and Battleground 2, Reigns and Bray Wyatt had a decent match. But it's time to move on. The matches aren't the issue. It's just that we've seen the same thing for months now, and it's time to move on to something new, both for the Wyatt family and for Ambrose and Reigns. I guess, like I said, they're going to be doing the six-man hell in the cell with Orton involved. But after that, Ambrose can move on to a feud with Jericho. They kind of planted the seeds for that at Night of Champions. And for Roman Reigns... Um, what do you do with him after that? Like I said, maybe a Cena feud over the U.S. title or a Rusev. Rusev doesn't mean anything right now. I have no idea. But, uh, yeah, I mean, just move him on to separate directions. I know that's not your question, how long it's going to last, but I would probably bet um, it's going to end at Hell in a Cell. It has to end there because they've already had how many matches on pay-per-view, and it's really time to kind of um, get to the conclusion, have the baby faces go over or whatever because they really need to uh, get Reigns back on track in singles competition. Ambrose, too. Um, his second question, do you see Sasha Banks winning the Divas Championship at WrestleMania 32? I hope so. I mean, I'm not going to say that she will because I don't think WWE thinks that long term in, term in terms of title changes. Maybe like matches they want to do, but I can't remember the last time they like mapped out a Divas match so far in advance. They don't, I mean, let's. I hate to say it, but they don't care that much about the Divas. They're going to map out stuff that far in advance. They just do it on the fly with the women. Um, so we'll, we'll see what they do with the women come WrestleMania. But what, what I want to see, absolutely. I definitely would love to see Banks and Charlotte at WrestleMania. Maybe you throw Becky in there. Bailey's up in the main roster by that point. You do the four-way from TakeOver last year or from earlier this year in February, which was an amazing match. Um, so I would do that match at WrestleMania. If not, just Charlotte Banks straight up, just one-on-one, -on -one, and I would just do that match, and it'd be a great boost for both women. You put the belt on Banks. You give Charlotte a nice little reign with the title. Banks wins the belt at WrestleMania, and... That's the best way to book it. So simple, maybe a little too predictable, but it's the best booking you could possibly do. Who else are going to put the belt on right now? Fucking Rosa Mendez, Brie Bella, um, Alicia Fox. Like, 
There's really no one else that makes more sense to put the belt on than Sasha Banks. She's more ready than Charlotte is. She should be champion right now, but I'd have no issue with waiting until WrestleMania to do that match at Mania between Charlotte and Banks, giving us our first real meaningful match at WrestleMania for the women um, since probably since Trish and Mickey James 10 years ago at WrestleMania 22, not 32. Um, next question, uh, third question of his. Who do you see Stardust feuding with after Neville? Um, again, who do I see them feud, putting him in a feud with? Probably no one. I mean, again, I don't think they care that much about Stardust. They're thinking about next feuds for him, which is unfortunate because the guy's very talented. I've you know praised him time and time again, both Cody Rhodes and the Stardust character, which he's kind of really come into his groove with um, the last couple of months since he came back from uh, taking his absence due to his, you know, grieving his father's death. But, yeah, I don't think they really have any plans for Stardust or Neville. You know, let's just be honest here. After this feud concludes, they're just throwing them in random six-mans and stuff like that until until they just get bored with it. I really have no idea. So I don't really see them having, like, a, oh, we're going to do this next with Neville or Stardust once this feud is over. What would I do? Like, again, what would I do with the women, with the match? But what would I do with this feud? Or what would I do with Stardust after a feud with Neville runs its course? Obviously, from a storyline standpoint, I would put him in a feud with Bad News Barrett, Wade Barrett, King Barrett, whatever the fuck you want to call him, um, when he comes back from filming his movie. He attacked him. That's how Barrett was written off television. He was attacked by uh, Stardust from behind. It's not even like he hit him with a steel chair. He just hit him with a crossroads, and that was it. And Barrett's been off TV ever since. So kind of a weak way of writing him out, but at least they bothered to write him out to begin with. But it makes sense. Barrett's never been a babyface before in his WWE career. It's something new for him. Maybe kind of rejuvenate his career, go back to being Wade Barrett. If you want to do the bad news thing, fine. At least it's over with the fans. But the King Barrett thing has got to stop. I feel like that's only hindered his momentum more than anything. If he had any momentum to begin with. Um, but yeah, I would probably just put him in a feud with Barrett. It makes the most sense from a storyline standpoint. Barrett should be wrapping up soon if he's not already done with the movie. So he should be back at some point. Um, but just drag on the feud with Neville and Stardust until Barrett is ready to come back and do that feud going into the uh, going into the winter season. Little Reynolds, moving into the Twitter questions here. Her question was, will Naomi ever win the Divas Championship and would a title match between her and Charlotte be a great Divas match? Um, I feel like she should. I mean, Naomi, if you think about it, five years ago, five fucking years ago this month, this woman made her WWE debut. Think of all the women that have held that belt in the last five years. You've had Alicia Fox. You've had Eve Torres, AJ Lee, Caitlyn, who was not a good worker at all. Naomi is such a better worker than Caitlyn. I love Caitlyn. She's gorgeous, but she was not a good worker. Um, Naomi is such a better worker than her. We've had Caitlyn as champion, Paige, AJ, Nikki, now Charlotte, all these countless, Brie Bella, fucking Kelly Kelly, all the other women that have held this belt in the last five years. Naomi has, I mean, the, the, the closest she came to winning that belt was earlier this year when she turned heel. That was the time to put the belt on her, but they didn't because they wanted to keep the reign going for Nikki Bella, which I thought was a mistake. If there was any time to put the belt on her, it was then and there, but they missed the opportunity, and they've ruined her. I mean, Team Bad is good because that has Sasha Banks in there, so that's kind of helped her get back on track a little bit, and she's won more matches um, than she probably ever has in the last couple of months with Team Bad. But people just don't see her. Like people, When she comes out by herself without Banks, without Tamina, people just don't care because she was booked to look like a loser because after losing so many matches earlier this year to Nikki Bella, people look at her as a loser and that she doesn't have any chance of winning the belt. But... Uh, will she ever win the Divas title? That's not for me to say, but will should she? Absolutely. If anyone deserves to reign with that belt, it should be Naomi. Uh, but if, if we do things the way I said them before, if we have put the belt on Banks at WrestleMania, maybe you do a feud with Banks and Naomi after that, and you could put the belt on Naomi down the line. Makes perfect sense to me. I just mapped out the Divas division for the next 10 months. Um, but yeah, I would put the belt on her at some point. She deserves it. She's come so far in the ring. She's a very good athlete, and she's also a, a decent heel. She's a better babyface, but she needed to turn to kind of uh, switch things up and spice things up in her career. And uh, you said, would a title match between her and Charlotte be a great Divas match? I think so. They've had some good matches in the last couple of months on SmackDown and on Raw. Charlotte, although she is not quite there yet, she's ready to be on the main roster. But I feel like Banks, complete package, she's there. Charlotte is almost there. A very good worker, though. Um, and Divas, I'm, Divas, um, I'm looking at the Divas thing in, in your question here. Um, Naomi is a very good worker in her own right, like I said, and I feel like the athleticism alone in that match would be very good and it could be a very good title program for the fall or before WrestleMania next year. Conquer 89, his question was, do you think that Brock Lesnar will be there when I go to Raw next Monday? Um, nothing's confirmed right now. Usually they, they advertise Brock Lesnar on the live event website, if not on Raw. I mean, we'll find out more tonight if he is going to be on the show. They might advertise him. I'm like, oh, next week Brock Lesnar returns to the Raw because, I mean, they have the Hell in the Cell match. 
in only a couple weeks, in about a month, and they've already announced that Lesnar and Taker and Shawn, uh, and Shawn Michaels and Stone Cold Steve Austin for the first time in over four and a half years will be on Raw, um, and Ric Flair too, which is fucking great. This whole show is going to be awesome. The go-home show for Hell in a Cell. Um, they're going to be on that show, both Taker and Lesnar, but I feel like they need to make at least one appearance. Maybe not Taker, but at least Lesnar um, to make an appearance on Raw before that. Hopefully next week, um, maybe the week after that. I'm not really sure. There's a chance it could happen next week. I would not put my money on it but because I haven't heard anything about him being advertised for any Raws except for that one on the Raw before Hell in a Cell. Um, but there's a chance. We'll see. At Cody Collier 37, his question was, who do you think is the most underrated wrestler in Ring of Honor and why? Good question. I was looking up and down the roster. They have a lot of great talent right now in NXT. Uh, Ring of Honor. Caprice Coleman, um, Cedric Alexander. They're both kind of missed of some storylines right now, so I can't really call them underrated, but they're both very good. Um, I would say either ACH or Matt Seidel. Matt Seidel, however you pronounce it. Um, the former Evan Bourne in WWE. I mean, granted, I don't know if ACH can talk. I know Matt Seidel has become a better talker, so he's still not like, you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin in the microphone or anything like that, but he's come a long way as a talker. He's a great athlete. I mean, ACH, the same exact thing. That's why I feel like they're underrated. They're not really doing anything of no. I feel like they're in the middle. I believe they're in the middle of, like, a best of five series right now. They had, a like, match three or four at the pay-per-view recently, at the All-Star Extravaganza pay-per-view. So, other than that, they're not really doing anything. I think they were a tag team at one point. They're just both so good. I'm just... You know, my, my mind, I'm just mind boggled. My mind is boggled. Um, it, it is mind boggling, I guess is the best way to say it. That they're not in more meaningful spots on the, on the card right now. I can see, again, they're maybe not the best mic workers, but they're both over with the audience. I mean, granted, everyone in, in Ring of Honor is, but they're both excellent athletes. And Silas Young, too. I mean, he's doing something with Dalton Castle right now, but he is a great talent, both in the ring, the real man's man character, and just everything about him. I, I really like Silas Young, so I feel like he's underrated, too. But, yeah, ACH, Seidel, and um, Young as well. At Swagzio, his question was, I love that username, by the way. His question was, should Brock Lesnar end Big Show's career in their match at MSG? Yes, yes, he should. <laughs> um, I mean, it would make perfect sense, too. Someone brought to this my attention a couple weeks ago saying, um, you know, I hated the idea of Big Show being Lesnar's opponent. Have it just be something new. Have it be someone fresh, like a Cesaro. We're a fucking Bo Dallas for all I care. We've seen Big Show and Lesnar so many times. We saw it a year ago when he raped him in the main event, not in the main event, but at the Royal Rumble match. Um, at the Royal Rumble. Not in the Rumble match itself, but you know what I mean. At the 2014 Rumble pay-per-view is where he just dominated them for like three minutes and just killed Brock, uh, Big Show. Brock Lesnar did. So I'm not really looking forward to it, but Big Show has been saying, I don't know if it's a shoot or if it's part of his character. I mean, it's probably a part of his character, but it's just funny when he gets in the mic and says it. When people start, you know, start chanting, please retire, Adam, during his matches, he gets in the mic and says, find someone to retire me. Who's going to put me down? I'm going to be here for another 10 years. All this other great stuff. It's so funny. And Brock Lesnar could be that guy. And you have Brock Lesnar do the same thing that he um, do have him do the same thing he did to Big Show last year, dominate him for three minutes. And if at the very least he's not going to end his career, which I feel like he won't, um, would be I would love to see it, obviously, given the fact I'm not a huge Big Show fan. But he won't, though. Um, at least take him off TV for a couple months. What else are you going to do with the Big Show right now? What else is he doing on programming at the moment that justifies keeping him around? He's not involved in any fresh feuds. The Miz feud couldn't give two shits about if that's even still going on. Um, so, yeah. I would just uh, take him off TV entirely after... After the MSG special, again, I don't feel like that's going to be the case. If anything, they'll probably push him even more. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, yeah, it would be a great time to do it, though, to have him end his career. Because what else is there for Big Show to do? I respect the hell out of Big Show. I respect Paul White. I love Paul White. Big Show, not so much. There's just nothing for him to do in 2015. So, yeah, I would have him take him off TV entirely um, after the MSG special. Hopefully after Lesnar just dominates him. If he's back on Raw that Monday, I'll be pissed. But not surprised, but I'll be pissed. I'll still be pissed. Um, at Sean Markistic, his question was, push repackage really Seth Rollins, Cesaro, and Bray Wyatt. Um, this is a really hard one. I said, regardless, repackage Rollins. He has a great character. He's an awesome heel, but I would repackage him into a babyface. I feel like that's going to be the role where he's going to be most comfortable. Um, if he's a great heel now, imagine how much better he will be as a babyface. He's going to be over like Rover when he eventually turns. So I would repackage him into a heel. And initially, I had this the other way around, but I switched it. And I said, push Wyatt. And release Cesaro. Before that, before this morning, I had it as push Cesaro, release Wyatt. Because I feel like Wyatt 
it's not that I don't know what it is. Both guys, they're just obviously not being given the given the time of day by management that they deserve. At least, you know, Wyatt is involved in a program. He's winning matches on pay-per-view. The same thing cannot be said for Cesaro. The guy is losing every single week, which is not a bad thing all the time. But when he's losing a big show for no reason in four minutes, then what the fuck was the point? You know what I mean? At least with Wyatt, of the two, I feel like, you know, Cesaro could be so much more popular than Wyatt just because he's organically over. Wyatt, they've never really just found a groove for him. I mean, he was on a roll in early 2014 before he ran into the roadblock that was John Cena, of course. Um, but I feel like, again, a lot of people have said, I think his money, the money with Wyatt will be where he turns his baby face, hopefully sooner rather than later. You would think it's the other way around as a heel, but he's just, I don't know, the same promos every single week. It's just not going to work out in the long term if he keeps on doing what he's doing. If he turns, maybe it might work out better for him. But I feel like... I mean, I could see Cesaro as world champion over Wyatt, but they've just tried time and time again with Cesaro to push him, and it just doesn't work out. Not because of something he did. It's all because of management. Absolutely because of management and the creative team. With Wyatt, though, they have not had that start and stop push yet. They just have no idea what to do with him. But once they find out what to do with him, um, I mean, he's kind of getting back in that groove with the Wyatt family being back, or at least most of it without Rowan, and now we have Braun Strowman. He's better off than he was six months ago, I'll tell you that much. Um, but I feel like there's still much more money to be made with Wyatt. With Cesaro, he's had opportunities. People might just, like with Ziggler, they might look at him in a certain way and say, you know what, he's never going to get above a certain level and he might never be successful in WWE. In Ring of Honor, which he already has been, but in Ring of Honor, Japan, Lucha Underground, something like that would be awesome. And I would put him over there to have him, great ma have, him have great matches and stuff. Um, but yeah, I would repackage Rollins, push Wyatt, and release Cesaro. Good question. That was a tough one. Um, and also one that made me think, too. His second question, do you think John Cena will ever break Ric Flair's record of 16 world title reigns? Absolutely. It's not really a matter of if he will. It's more a matter of when. And it's absolutely going to happen. People, just save the bitching, you know, just... I mean, it's you can complain all you want about Cena breaking the record or the WWE's record. I think in reality it's like 17 or 18, maybe even more than that. I have no idea. But WWE's magic number is 16. And Cena's going to be wrestling for a long time to come. If he doesn't win that belt another two more times, I'd be shocked. Um, that's the day the world ends. So, I mean, we can all get our bitching and moaning out of the way right now because it's not going to happen. It's not going to not happen, I guess I should say. He's going to break the record. Um, I'm glad it hasn't happened yet. He hasn't held the belt since SummerSlam of last year. So kudos to WWE for trying to make a new star in Seth Rollins and um, not putting him in the main event of pay-per-view since Survivor Series, which is awesome for the Cena character. He's doing the best work of his career right now, in my opinion. A lot of people, other a lot of other people, will tell you the same thing. Um, but yeah, he will break the record at some point. And also, WWE brought it to my attention a couple days ago in their power rankings when they said that he could also break the record for Ric Flair's most U.S. title reigns too. Something I completely forgot about. Cena is now a five-time United States champion, the most of any person in WWE history. In the history of that title, you know, I mean, WWE's lineage dates back, I think, only to 03. I don't know if it goes back all the way to WCW lineage. Um, but Ric Flair held, out, held that belt, I think, six times. So he could always break that one, too. It's not as likely, but he's definitely going to break that world title reign. No question about it. Next question from at the underscore zero S1S. You are against a Divas Money in the Bank. What are your thoughts on, say, a tag team Money in the Bank? Now, for a tag team Money in the Bank, it sounds cool. It's something new. And I was talking to John about this a while ago, and he has a great mind for wrestling, so he definitely knows what he's talking about when he's talking about this, about how, like, how long can you, and he brought up a great question, how long can you keep on doing the Money in the Bank concept before it gets old? Not only the match itself, but just, like, people winning the match and cashing it in, and how many more times can you switch it up, do it differently? Like with Seth Rollins, they did it in the main event of WrestleMania in the middle of a match. We've never seen that before. Like I applaud WWE for doing something new and not doing the same thing they've been doing for 10 years. That match has been around for 10 years now. Believe it or not, it's crazy to think about. It's been around for a decade. But how much longer can they do the match before people just don't want to see it anymore? The same thing with the matches themselves. This year's Money in the Bank ladder match when Sheamus won, it really wasn't that good of a match because we've seen a lot better um, Money in the Bank ladder matches before. They've set the bar so high, it's going to be hard for them to top it every single year. It was just more of the same from those guys. It was a good ladder match, but in comparison to past Money in the Bank ladder matches, not as good. Um, but the point I'm trying to make here is that it was something, you know, what else can we do to make it feel fresh again? And I feel like they tried that with the chamber matches. Now, I liked it in theory that they were doing a tag team chamber match and an IC title ladder, uh, IC chamber match. Both matches, however, were terrible in my opinion. The, the, the tag team one was okay. It was passable. A lot better than the IC one. 
Um, it's just, I don't know, it was just too much of a clusterfuck with like how many guys? You had six tag teams and all three members of New Day. So that's six times, let's see here, um, six times two, 12 people, 13 if you include all three members of New Day. That's way too many people to have in one chamber match. It just became too much of a mess. Um, but I applaud the effort. With the IC title one, it's not a matter, they didn't have more people. It was the same amount of people as always. It's just the booking of that match was total clusterfuck, did not go the way it was planned. Um, just a lot of made-up spots on the fly and all this other stuff. The match sucked. Um, anyway, so I it goes back to that. So I feel like a tag team Money in the Bank, of how many teams you have, like six teams? It's like having a tag team ladder match, like three teams like we saw in 2000. That's enough. It's enough chaos to kind of fulfill a match. And some of the best tag team ladder matches, ladder matches period of all time. Um, when we had the Dudley Boys, the Hardy Boys, Edge and Christian, all these other tag teams for the year of 2000. But if you throw six tag teams in there and you have all these other teams and stuff like that, I feel like it wouldn't work out as well if you have like the entire division. So, I mean, it's something they can try. I can definitely see that happening. But I don't know. With just If you throw six tag teams, that's like, again, six times two is 12 people. One match, one or a couple ladders, of course, but 12 people in one match is way too much. So I can kind of see it happening. But again, it also kind of goes back to the Divas Money in the Bank ladder match where I said last week where there's not that many women in the division to justify there being a briefcase. Like a tag team ladder match, like for the titles, I could see that with maybe six teams. Again, kind of pushing it on too many. Um, but if you have six, uh, like, uh, six teams and then one of them wins a future title shot, there's not even six teams in the division right now. We have Dudley Boys, Players, the Matadors. I you know, hate to call them a tag team, but they are. Um, the Usos will be back soon. Wyatt Family, Ambrose Reigns. So maybe we have six tag teams or so. But if not more than that, so it wouldn't really make any sense to do a match where there is a future shot at the tag team titles at stake. Maybe for the titles themselves, not for a future shot at the tag team titles. There's not enough teams for that, you know, for that to make any sense. Um, next question from Matt RJ underscore Marceau. Question was, how do you see the authority being address or addressing Kane tonight on Raw? Um, I mean, it all really kind of depends how they get to the championship match at Hell in the Cell. From a storyline standpoint, what has Kane done to deserve a shot at the belt at the pay-per-view? You know, he just came back, he beat the crap out of Rollins, the Authority's boy. So unless there's tension between Rollins and the Authority, which has been teased in the past month, I don't see how they can get to that point where Kane gets a title shot. Unless, which I was thinking, where they might grant him a title shot for whatever reason, I have no idea. Maybe to beat some shit into Seth Rollins, I'm not exactly sure. But they can do something along the lines of... You, and if you want to go for the championship, because they know it's the same person despite all the Demon Kane, Corporate Kane bullshit, um, if they want to address that it, Kane has to give up his position as the director of operations and therefore that qualifies him for a, uh, for a title shot at the pay-per-view, I can see that happening. But again, like, what has Kane done to get a title shot? The match is happening regardless. That's, but just from a storyline standpoint, it doesn't make any sense. But um, that's one thought, I guess. Like tonight on Raw, they give him a, uh, an ultimatum. If you want to go for the title, if you want to, set, if you want to face Seth Rollins in the pay-per-view, you have to step down as the director of operations, which, again, would make a little more sense because he's still doing both characters, and that would kind of write off Corporate Kane. So that's the best guess that I have, but I guess we'll find out tonight uh, more on Raw. Next question from Matt Big Bird 432 How would you make SmackDown relevant again? I mean, so much effort would have to go in to make that show mean something again. That SmackDown has not meant anything in fucking God knows how long, at least since the brand split ended four or five years ago. It's just that it's become a run-on, a repeat of Raw every single week. So there's not really much more that you can do with it to kind of make it more meaningful again. I mean, I wrote down three different things here. Obviously, a new look. And people have said this before, and it's kind of like same, uh, similar to TNA, where if they want to have it be a true alternative to WWE, to Raw... Um, they need to make it feel completely different from Monday nights. So that's Paul Heyman. That was Paul Heyman's mindset when he was running SmackDown in 02, 03, 04. Um, we want to make it completely different. Different style, different voice, different aura, different feel, different look. That's why they had the big fist. But when they went HD in 2008, I think it was, all the sets were the same. Raw, SmackDown, ECW, Superstars, everything, every single set was the same. So SmackDown, even before the brand split even ended, was kind of like the the... Oh, there's like Raw another two more hours. You know, and Raw's already three hours as it is. So you add another two hours for SmackDown, it's like overkill with a casual fan. So to make SmackDown mean something again, I would probably, again, give it a new look. I don't know how much they can do with that and, um, you know, kind of switch up the look from Raw. 
but I would give it a new look. Go live is obviously the biggest thing. People just, I don't even think people look at the spoilers anymore because they don't just give a shit about SmackDown because the same match that happened on Raw happened on SmackDown. So people aren't going to watch SmackDown regardless of whether they read the spoilers or not. So going live would not boost up the rating like three points, like a full point or so, but it would be a step in the right direction. And last but not least, like I mentioned, you got to bring back the brand split. I mean, I've talked about it here on the show at nauseum in the past because I'm such a huge mark for the brand split. I just don't see it being brought back um, at any point in the near future, if ever, just because they never really did it right the first time. Maybe for the first few years, I would reckon maybe until, like I would argue from 02 to maybe 05, I would say. But other than that, they never really did the brand split right or the Raw and SmackDown feud. Just SmackDown, for the most part, in 02, maybe for like a cup of coffee, it was a lot better than Raw in terms of quality. But... It was always branded as the B Show, and it always will be. WWE, or at least Vince anyway, does not want his baby to stray away from being the flagship show of the company. They're never going to be equals, um, but if they really want to make that show mean something again, they got to bring back the brand split, bring back the World Heavyweight Championship, make exclusive to SmackDown. Again, that belt never really meant anything because WWE treated it like trash, but again, it's something um, worth considering if they really want to make SmackDown relevant again. And I don't think just using just moving to USA Network next year in, in January, or maybe switching back to Fridays and going live. Again, they'll treat it like it's it, as it's important for their first few weeks. But after a month or so, it's going to go back to just being rematches from Raw and no new content, Raw replays. Like that's ridiculous. They had an instance a couple weeks ago where they replayed like three quarters of the main event from Raw. Like if anyone who watches SmackDown obviously watches Raw, so it makes absolutely no sense in order to do something like that. But anyway. Um, to, make, to make SmackDown relevant again, you got to bring back the brand split, have it go live, give it a completely different look. Again, it's going to take a lot of effort that WWE, I don't think, would want to put into SmackDown at this point. It's just a dead brand. I would get rid of it altogether. You don't need as much wrestling as you do with superstars, main events, SmackDown, all this other shit, in addition to all the other promotions and stuff, Lucha, TNA, Ring of Honor, and so on and so forth. It's just useless, but they, maybe they make money off of it, so that's why it's still around 10 years later, but... Um, yeah, that's what I would do to make SmackDown relevant again. At Reborn again, what are your two favorite and two least favorite Hell in the Cell matches of all time? Like I said earlier, I'm probably going to do another video at some point listing my top five, if not like top seven, favorite Cell matches of all time. So I won't mention them here, although I probably talked about them in the past here on the show. Um, but for two least favorite, I would say... Um, I wrote down, ta initially I wrote down Taker and Big Boss Man. I thought that match was just not good. I mean, it was so bad that it was not involved, it's not even included in the Hell in the Cell competition DVD they put out a couple years ago that includes every Cell match ever from 97 to 2007 between Batista and Undertaker from Survivor Series of that year. Of every Cell match, even the ones on Raw are included. The one with Bossman and Taker from WrestleMania 15 was so bad they don't mention it, they don't even put it on the DVD. It's that fucking bad. Um, but So yeah, I would probably include that one, but the two other ones... You said two least favorite, and I have only seen that match once. For the other two, I would probably say, I already mentioned DX and Legacy from 09 Hell in a Cell. It wasn't a bad match. I just personally didn't like it. They told the decent story, but the match itself wasn't really much of a match. It wasn't what I was hoping for, so I don't like that match. That one's a given. For the other one, I put Punk versus Ryback and Heyman from the 2013 show. Um, that was a few that kind of needed the cell. I didn't need the cell, but it was a few that made sense inside the cell because Punk and Heyman, that feud had been going on for so long. You know, it was a match that needed the cell structure to kind of blow off the feud um, at, for, at long last. And so I can kind of see why they did the cell structure. But the match, essentially, it w was compromised of Heyman being on top of the cell for the entire time. And then Punk beating the living shit out of Ryback inside the cell for 10 minutes. I don't think Ryback got one offensive mover in that entire match. It was awful. And then afterwards, after Punk just makes Ryback look a com like a complete pussy throughout the entire match, he climbs on top of the cell and gets his vengeance, uh, gets his, you know, gives Heyman his comeuppance. But once he finally did that, and after the match, he beats the shit out of Heyman, which is a cool sight. But they had dragged on the feud for far too long, way much long, way longer than they should have, that it didn't mean as much than if they did it at. Night of Champions, or Battleground, or even SummerSlam, you know, at that point, people were like, whatever. So it didn't even matter. The match sucked, the angle towards the end sucked, Ryback was dead for like another year until he came back with the Feed Me More as the babyface a year ago. Um, he was dead in the water, Heyman, the whole payoff was, again, it was good, but they waited way too long, Punk didn't benefit from it, he went on to do nothing with like the Wyatt family and the Shield, and it's just kind of a dead cause at that point, um... 
But yeah, those are my two least favorite Hell in a Cell matches. I mean, all the other all the other early ones, even the ones from Raw from like 97 to 98 and 99, were, were good. I mean, they were better than these. Um, these matches just didn't really mean anything. So yeah, DX and Legacy from 09, and then Punk versus Ryback and Heyman from the... Uh, from the 2013 show. And the final three questions here from at Zach Donegan. Top five favorite women's matches of all time. I mean, they're all from NXT, all but one. Um, Bailey and Banks, far, far above and beyond the best women's match I've ever seen, if not one of the best matches I've ever seen, period, from TakeOver. I mean, that was partially because I was there, but that match was so amazing from a storyline standpoint. Build up the Iron Woman match coming up in the, on the WWE Network and everything else going on with, uh, you know, with that match. Everything else that went into it, the in-ring action, the characters, the crowd, everything was amazing. So, above and beyond Bailey and Banks from TakeOver last month. The four-way from TakeOver in February between Charlotte, Banks, Bailey, and Banks. Or is it? No, no. Bailey, Charlotte, ba Bailey, Charlotte, Banks, and Becky Lynch. Those four. Yeah. So, that match was great. Love that match uh, from the TakeOver special in February. Uh, Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks from the special in May. Again, another amazing match. They didn't really have much build-up, but the match itself was great. Paige and Emma from the first ever NXT TakeOver special in 2014, um, which I thought was a great match and kind of started the so-called Divas Revolution. I mean, I'm leaving off Charlotte and Natalya. It was a great match, but you said favorite. I don't know. It just wasn't one of my favorite matches. It was a great match. Don't get me wrong. Kind of launched the career of Charlotte, um, but it wasn't one of my favorites for whatever reason. But I wanted to include another match that was not NXT, so I put in AJ and Caitlyn from the 2013 Payback show, which was a great show, top to bottom. The first hour was fucking off the charts amazing. Um, but the match was very good. It was the first, like, truly great women's feud slash match in a very, very long time. They told a great story. It was. They got a lot of time, and the in-ring action was solid. AJ, um, I think Caitlyn had the match won, and instead she opted to kind of taunt AJ instead. And that kind of cost her in the end. AJ locked in the, uh, the Black Widow submission hold. Forces Caitlyn to tap out. She wins her first Divas title. Goes on to reign as Divas, Divas champion for the next 10 months. So kind of kicked off her historic reign as Divas champion. So everything that went into the match, the moment, the match itself, I thought was great. So um, I would be remiss if I didn't include that in my top five favorite women's matches of all time. And your final two questions here. Favorite Shane McMahon match? It's got to be tied between the match with Angle from, I think, the 01 King of the Ring show. I'm pretty sure it was 01. And then the match with Blackman from uh, SummerSlam 2000. I mean, if only for the spot when he fell off the top of the fucking rafters, which was incredible. Um, you would never see something like that today. But yeah, the match with Blackman from SummerSlam 2000 and the match with Angle, which was so hard-hitting and the suplexes through the glass panels, it was crazy. Um, but yeah, those two matches were amazing. Shane McMahon, such underrated as an athlete. I mean, people recognize how great he was as a wrestler. But if, when you really look back and watch the matches at Unforgiven over the years and SummerSlam and all these other matches from the Attitude Era and beyond, he was still wrestling up until 2009 when he faced Randy Orton up, up until his um, departure from the company. The guy was still a great wrestler even then. But um, yeah, I would include those two matches. The match against Angle from 01 King of the Ring and the match with Blackman from 2000 SummerSlam. And your final question, your favorite Kane match... It was hard, because I think I can name probably more Shane McMahon matches that I liked than Kane matches. It's not that he's a bad worker. It's just that, I don't know, he's not a great worker. He's a good worker. It's just that he's not great enough to have memorable matches. You know, I was trying to think from when I became a fan in 08, how many truly great matches he's had um, in the last seven years. And I, honest to God, could not really think of many. He has not had many memorable feuds. I mean, the matches with, like, Rey Mysterio... Great colleague, God forbid. Um, I'm trying to think. You know, the matches that he had with John Cena weren't, like, amazing. Those are kind of poop, too. Uh, he's really... I mean, maybe the matches with Team Hell No. Oh, you know, obviously, I'd probably go with, if you're not... If you want to include this one, Daniel Bryan, Kane, and Ryback from versus The Shield in their first ever match, TLC 2012. Amazing match. One of the best matches of that year. So, I'd probably go with that match. But if you're talking about Kane singles matches... Um, probably the match with Undertaker from 2010 Night of Champions. Not an amazing match, but I just really like that feed for whatever reason. And, um, I mean, they probably had better, they've obviously had better matches in the past during the Attitude Era. Um, but I don't know. I like that match for whatever reason. I thought the No Holds Bars stipulation was good. Kane winning clean shocked me to death. So I thought that was a very good match. Um, but yeah, top to bottom, I thought it was, uh, awesome. So I thought it was fantastic. But, um, yeah, the entire, you know, every Kane match is good. It's just not great enough to truly be memorable. Um, but yeah, I would say every Kane match, including that one with Taker, they had a solid series of matches at Night of Champions, Hell in the Cell, and at Bragney Rights 2 in the um, casket match or whatever it was. Um, but I would say of those three matches, that the one at Night of Champions was probably the best. So I would go with that one. 
Um, but yeah, that tops off this week's video. So I appreciate you guys sending the questions. If you want to do so, feel free to tweet me on Twitter at restaurant. Find me on Facebook at, or you know, tweet me with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook at facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews and leave a comment on the post I usually put up on Sunday nights or on the wall itself. And last but not least, be sure to leave a comment on this very video. I'll be sure to include your question in next week's edition. Be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. All support is greatly appreciated. Again, thank you for watching. You guys are great. Have a great rest of your week. I'm Graham Jason Matthews, and I'll catch you guys down the road.